You have probably all seen or even played with one of these plasma globes. We are going to look and see what we can figure out about how they operate. If I take a fluorescent bulb and move it close, you see that it lights up. And if I turn the plasma globe off, it goes off. As I bring a fluorescent tube towards the globe, it will light. When we put a fluorescent bulb or tube into a fixture, there's an AC voltage applied to the two ends of the tube, which results in an AC electric field inside the tube. So the plasma globe is putting out an AC electric field that's going through our fluorescent tubes and causing them to light. So the plasma globe is putting out an AC electric field that extends beyond what we see inside the globe. I have an analog discovery 2 which attaches to my laptop and one of the pieces of test equipment it has is an oscilloscope. Now I fastened a loop antenna from some magnet wire, so I've removed the insulation from the end of the wire, and I'm going to connect it to the oscilloscope input to my analog discovery 2. The globe is off and the oscilloscope trace is flat, indicating my antenna is not picking anything up. So let me turn on the plasma globe, and you see I'm picking up an AC signal, a very strong one. So let me move the plasma globe further away. And let me capture the signal. And the period is about three divisions, which is 30 microseconds. So the electric field that the plasma globe is putting out has a period of 30 microseconds. A period of 30 microseconds means the electromagnetic wave coming from the plasma globe has a frequency of 33 kilohertz. The product of the frequency times the wavelength of a wave is equal to its speed. The speed of an electromagnetic wave is 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. So the wavelength of the electromagnetic wave coming from the plasma globe is 9.1 kilometers. So we can treat the plasma globe as a lump circuit element. I could try taking the plasma globe apart to further investigate the source of the AC electromagnetic wave, but I already know that the source is a Tesla coil that has a frequency of about 35 kilohertz and a voltage of about 5 kilovolts. If you take a closer look at the oscilloscope trace, you'd see that the period is actually a little bit less than 30 microseconds. So the frequency of our globe is probably about 35 kilohertz. I'm going to place a dime on top of the globe. I'm now going to bring a wire close to the dime. And when I get close enough, I'll get ionization of the air between the wire and the dime. And I have to get closer than a millimeter to get the ionization to occur. Now I have a light emitting diode. I'm going to hold one terminal and bring the other terminal towards the dime. And as the air ionizes between the terminal and the dime, we see that the light emitting diode turns on. The outer globe is about 
seven centimeters in diameter and the region inside of the Tesla coil is about a centimeter across. Our plasma globe consists of our Tesla coil of approximately half a centimeter radius and the globe with a radius of about 3.5 centimeters. The Tesla coil is oscillating around 33 to 35 kilohertz and it has an amplitude of 5,000 volts. Therefore the inner region is going to oscillate between plus and minus 5,000 volts. Since the wavelength of our electromagnetic wave is approximately 10 kilometers, we can treat the plasma globe as if it were a capacitor. When we're at the peak voltage of 5 kilovolts, we'll have some charge Q on our Tesla coil. This will be one conductor of our capacitor. The electric field lines will emanate from this positive charge, looking for negative charge to terminate on. If there's no other conductor close by, you can consider these electric field lines as going off to infinity, looking for negative charge to terminate on, and so you can think of the other conductor of the capacitor as being at infinity. We know the electric field lines will have this form, our charge on our Tesla coil over 4 pi epsilons sub 0 r squared. So let me group this q over 4 pi epsilon sub 0 as some value k. Since the voltage is 5,000 volts, that's the voltage between our Tesla coil and our other conductor of our capacitor, which we're putting at infinity. So that voltage is minus the integral from infinity to the Tesla coil of the electric field times dr. So we can solve for k and we get this equation for our electric field intensity. Putting in the value at the surface of the Tesla coil of half a centimeter, we see that the electric field intensity coming off the Tesla coil is 10 to the 6 volts per meter or 1 megavolt per meter. We can also calculate the voltage drop across the globe, and that will be 4.3 kilovolts, so we'll have 700 volts dropped outside of our globe. The dielectric breakdown strength of air is 3 megavolts per meter, and the peak electric field inside our globe is 1 megavolt per meter. This indicates that there is a reduced pressure inside the globe. The filaments we see in the globe are plasma, a hot ionized gas. If we have a free electron, it will be accelerated by the electric field. It will gain kinetic energy, and it will gain the maximum kinetic energy when we're at the peak voltage, either plus or minus 5,000 volts. If that kinetic energy is large enough, when it encounters a neon atom, it will have enough energy to knock an electron off, ionizing that neon atom. Now we'll have two electrons and a neon ion. These two electrons will now be accelerated by the electric field. They will encounter neon atoms, kicking off electrons and ionizing them. Now we'll have four electrons and three neon ions. This process continues and forms those plasma filaments. The visible spectrum goes from violet to red, corresponding to wavelengths of 380 nanometers to 700 nanometers. Light is an electromagnetic wave. When you have a beam of light at just one wavelength, that beam of light can increase or decrease in energy by a fixed amount called the photon energy. And that photon energy is given by this equation, and the size of that energy of those photons increases as the wavelength decreases. 
So a beam of light at 625 nanometers can only increase or decrease in energy by steps of 1.65 electron volts. The energy it takes to ionize a neon atom is 21.56 electron volts. The reverse process of a neon ion capturing electron releases 21.56 electron volts in the form of a photon. That photon will have a wavelength of 57.5 nanometers, which is well outside the visible range. The light we see in those filaments is not coming from neon ions recapturing electrons. It is coming from interatomic transitions of electrons going from higher orbits to lower orbits in the neon ions. The neon ions and the electrons are oscillating back and forth in response to the AC electric field, and they're going in opposite directions because of the opposite charge. In addition, the plasma is at a high temperature, so these particles all have very high thermal velocities. So they're doing a lot of colliding. This will result in electrons inside the neon ions being kicked up to higher orbits. Removing an electron will ionize the neon atom indicated by this open circle. As the ions and electrons collide in the plasma, electrons can be kicked up to higher orbits. When these electrons return to lower orbits, that energy is released as a photon. In neon, the transition from the 5s to the 2p orbit releases a photon with wavelength 632.8 nanometers in the red range. When I touch opposite sides of the plasma globe, two dominant filaments form. Let's consider the part of the cycle where the Tesla coil is charged positively and before I touch the globe. The electric field lines will emanate from the positive charge and go off looking for negative charges to terminate on. As I approach the globe, I will act as a ground, a source of those negative charges. So the electric fields emanating from the positive charges do not have to go off to infinity looking for negative charges to terminate on. They will find those in my fingers. The positive charges will rearrange, increasing the electric field intensity between the Tesla coil and my fingers and reducing the electric field intensity everywhere else. The plasma will intensify in these increased electric field intensity regions and reduce elsewhere. This explains the formation of the dominant filaments when the globe is touched. Also, the plasma filaments are much hotter than the surrounding unionized regions and why they rise. The filaments change color at the glass, probably because of cooling of the plasma by the glass. When the cooler, less energetic ions collide, the electrons are not promoted to as high an energy orbit, leading to less energetic photons being emitted. Earlier we saw that with the dime on top of the globe, if I brought an electrode close, I could get ionization of the air between the electrode and the dime. And if the electrode was one end of a light emitting diode and I was holding the other end, the LED would light up. With the dime on top of the globe, the electric field from the globe will pull electrons to the bottom of the dime, 
but the dime is overall neutral, so you'll have positive charge on the top of the dime. So when we're at the peak of 5,000 volts on our Tesla coil, we saw earlier that we had about 4,300 volts drop between the Tesla coil and the edge of the globe, and then we had an additional 700 volts dropped outside of the globe. Assuming the voltage drop outside the globe remains 700 volts, we have 700 volts dropped over the spacing between the end terminal of the LED and the dime. Let's call that distance D. The electric field intensity in this region will increase as the spacing decreases. When the electric field intensity in this region gets large enough, we'll see ionization of the air between the electrode and the dime. Finally, I don't know what gases I have in my plasma globe as I don't have the capability to do emission spectroscopy. But here is what emission from xenon would look like. I probably have xenon and neon in my globe with the blue light coming from the xenon and the pinkish light coming from neon.